One of the well-known wildlife biologists today, Dr. Yadvendra Dhala, has trained numerous students in the field of animal ecology and conservation biology. His studies of the Indian wolf and Asiatic lion have brought new insights into the life of these threatened carnivores. He has been associated with the Wildlife Institute of India for more than 20 years and in this time has worked extensively on Indian carnivore ecology. He is also associated with the Smithsonian Institution and a member of IUCN Specialist Group for Wolves and Canids. We would now request Dr. Chala to tell us more regarding the current conservation scenario in India and the road ahead. So please. Everybody. And it's a pleasure coming to Mumbai. I took up the invite as soon as uh, Deepak asked me to come. It's like homecoming. Um, I've been a Mumbaiite all my life, but uh, I've been working with the Wildlife Institute for the last 25 years or so. So I've done my schooling and college and uh, joined the society way back in early 80s. So I'm more of a Bombay Natural History Society member, just like you, you all, than a scientist from the Institute. And it has had a big role in shaping my career, as well as uh, what I'm going to present. It's going to be a little tough at this time of the night to keep you entertained for the next 45 minutes, as well talk about conservation. So let me try and have a go at it. Um, I'm going to talk about what I know best. Um, my previous speakers have actually covered a lot of ground. And I'm going to go a little more in depth of what they talked about. I'm going to talk about my perspectives on wildlife conservation, current scenarios in India, and how we can go ahead with doing conservation in the country. Why are we worried about conservation? Life comes and goes on Earth. Extinctions happen, and it's a very natural process. Dinosaurs were there. Almost 95% of all the species that have evolved on this planet have become extinct. We have only about 5% left now. But we still all gathered here to stop extinctions in this planet. Why? There are about anywhere between 10 to 30 million species. Most of them are known to science. And many of them will vanish from this earth before we actually document them. But the current rates of extinction are about 100 to 300 times higher than the basal levels which are on this planet. And the sole reason for this high rates of extinction, can we have these lights off please? They're not required. Yeah. The sole the reason for is us, basically. Since we evolved, we have started impacting this planet and causing this mass extinction. We evolved about two million years ago, but it is only in the last 40,000 years that we have started changing the environment in which we live making it more conducive to ourselves and less conducive for other biota on this planet. 40,000 years ago, we discovered fire. And that's when the destruction started. It's only in the last 2,000 years that this mass extinction events are actually exacerbated to a very high level. However, there are certain cultures on this planet. The same people who are responsible for this extinction as nature has also endowed them with intellect to redress their actions on this planet. And I think we are the chosen few here who are present who can make this happen and make convince our other fellow you know, uh, co-inhabitants of this planet to do the same. Now this cultural ethos is unique to the East. It's very different in the West. We have a custodial nature towards all biota on Earth, most of us do. And but if you look at the Western cultures, they have a different uh, utilitarian point of view. Because of this, the first nature reserves on this planet were established about 400 BC by Ashoka, Abhayaranyas. And that's the legacy we are following today, which has evolved in our country. However, our culture is not fraught with everything which is really nice. You know, We had our eras where we went into devastating use of natural resources. Um, Shikar was one of the traditions and then it became a sort of a norm in the colonial era uh, and just after independence where it sort of became a social norm to go and hunt wildlife just to you know, have a status in society. However, the, the beginning of the new conservation or the modern conservation era started somewhere in the early 70s. Uh, it had actually started brewing much earlier, but it took shape in the early 70s with uh, leaders like Salim Ali, 
and foresters like Kailash Shankla and leaders like Madam Gandhi. We had a legislation which was put out, the Wildlife Protection Act, and the first conservation project, which I did not know JC was involved in it. I, I respect for the man goes up tremendously. Uh, it started off in 1973. We, in the early um, 1800, in, in the 1980s, we um, sort of 1980s and 1990s, we were basking in the glory that we had achieved a lot of conservation in this country. However, there was a huge trade in wildlife in Southeast Asia. And most of the wildlife species started becoming depleted. The forest dwindled and their attention changed and they started looking at our sources and our natural resources. We faced the crisis which is there today of the Southeast Asian markets coming to India and devastating our natural biodiversity. The common threats which threaten all biota on the planet due to our activities are also very common in India with India having the largest investment in infrastructure coming up in the near future. If you can look at this, we've got a commitment of about 250 billion US dollars to be spent in the next five years in India from the government of India and we are requesting the rest of the, the, rest of the world to give us about 1.5 trillion dollars to be invested in infrastructure. If this comes about, we'll be making about 10,000 kilometers of highway each year in our country. Okay? And that's great. A development, as my leaders talked about, my previous speakers, is very essential for our society. But at what cost? If you have unplanned or ill-planned development, it can be devastating for biodiversity. And development has to go hand in hand with biodiversity conservation. How do we make this happen? We've been having a huge conflict. I work with large carnivores, so I'm a little biased in my talk about carnivores. Huge conflict with large carnivores. Um, they compete for food with us. They compete for space. They eat our cattle, and they eat us as well. So what we have done is we waged a war against them over the years. We have decimated their populations, even paid bounties to get rid of them. And this has caused serious declines in most uh, large carnivores across the globe, and especially in our country. So what I'm going to do in the rest of the talk is I'm going to concentrate on some of the relevant concepts shaped in our country. Surrogates for biodiversity, species biology, human wildlife conflict, and the controversial issue of relocation and coexistence with communities, which we just talked about um, and we felicitated our colleague from the Northeast. Selecting flagship or umbrella species, large carnivores. Many of my colleagues uh, really grudge that the tiger gets all the funding. But well, yes, there is an important aspect to that as well. The cheetah is the only large carnivore. You can hear me at the back? Carnivore which has become extinct in the Indian subcontinent after our independence. And the government had plans to bring it in, but it is uh, met with certain uh, pitfalls for the time being. But hopefully, uh, maybe in, in our lifetimes, we might see the wild cheetah uh, roaming our grasslands again. But if you see the role of the cheetah in the Indian context, the, the two antelopes, the chinkara and the black buck, have evolved under the predation pressure of cheetah. So these animals, which serve as a, on the top of the food chain on the trophic level actually have cascading effects on the ecosystem. They shape evolutionary functions. And by protecting these flagships or umbrella species as you call them, you can have a whole plethora of species being protected under that umbrella. So this concept of having umbrella species for as surrogates of biodiversity is what the Indian government picked up very early and we had Project Tiger being initiated in 1973. So the tiger is an icon of biodiversity conservation across pan-Asian forests. And it not only is an icon of biodiversity conservation, it looks at ecosystem goods, services, and, and the entire spectrum 
of uh, economics which these forests actually represent. The investment in Project Tiger by the government is phenomenal. Uh, this year, the budget for Project Tiger alone was doubled. It was 150 crores in the last year. This year, it is about 300 crores. So the Modi government, the BJP, has actually put in much more money than the previous government had in Project Tiger. Of course, there are several other things which I'll talk about as we go about how the government should look at it. And what we and my colleagues sitting here in the audience, Kamar Qureshi, do is we monitor tigers as a surrogate for monitoring biodiversity in the country across India every four years. And this is like keeping the pulse of what's happening to our wildlife populations in India. If you look at lions, this is another large carnivore which evolved somewhere in southern Africa and came into Asia in two waves, one after the other. There were about 200,000 lions about two decades ago. Now there are 20,000 left across India and Asia. Most of these lion populations are dwindling. Tigers, 97% of the tiger range is gone. The population has dwindled. We believe there were close to about 50,000 tigers at the turn of the century in India. Now there are about 2,200 left. So these populations are declining at very rapid rates. If you look at the tiger distribution uh, in the 16th and the 18th century in India, and the current distribution, you can see how dismal the situation is today. What is happening in this area? If you see the central Indian landscape, which Deepak wants to set up and monitor for the long term, this is the forest cover of central India, Kanha, uh, Satpura, Pench, Melghat, Bandogad, all these tiger reserves. The human population has increased tenfold in this time period. It has resulted in fragmentation, forest patch size is declining, and connectivities between these forest patches is going very rapidly. So this is a major concern, not only in central India, but across the forests of Asia and the world. The concept of island biogeography, which we talked about, what size of reserves should be there to prevent extinction. This was brought to us somewhere in the late 60s by MacArthur and Wilson. And they said that they looked at island biogeography and they brought out a theory which said that larger islands means more species. The closer the island to the mainland means more species can survive on that island. The same concept is applicable to reserves or which are actually small patches of habitat in a sea of humanity. If you look at this island biogeography theory, then the largest reserves in the world, which is Serengeti, about 30,000 square kilometers, and the Yellowstone ecosystem, which is about 72,000 square kilometers. The theory predicts that in the next 500 years, 30% of the mammalian fauna are likely to go extinct, just because these reserves are too small to have them for a long term. Now compare the size of these with our Indian protected areas. Okay. The average size of a protected area is about 239 square kilometers. Just too small. Okay. We have some statistics here, about 8.7, uh, 4 point, about 5% are in protected areas, 1.2 under national parks, but we do not have Serengetis or Yellowstones in India. What's going to happen to our species when even the Serengeti is too small to preserve large mammals? Why do small populations become extinct? Smallness itself is a disease. And there are many factors which cause extinction when you become small. So small is bad. You want the population of wild animals to be as large as possible. A minimum size which biologists recommend is you should have at least 500 individuals in a population for it to be viable. There are many factors here which cause um, extinction of small populations. Somewhere in the late 70s, around 73, a new theory came up which was known as a metapopulation theory. This theory was looking at islands like the Galapagos. You had species living for hundreds of years and still not becoming extinct, while island biogeography was talking that, okay, if you don't have this size, species would become extinct. This was a contradiction. And Lewis explained this by the theory of metapopulation, where he said that you don't need a mainland to actually allow animals to move between this island and the mainland, but animals can actually move between the small islands themselves and prevent extinction from happening. So in, instead of having a large Serengeti, if you had small, small, small pieces of land which we join together, habitats, 
then persistence of species could be achieved in such habitats. And this is exactly the model which India needs to follow. Because we cannot create Serengetis or Yellowstones, but we do have small reserves scattered across our landscapes. All we need to do is keep them connected. How do we do this is another matter. So first of all, what we need to know is what we have and where we have it. If you don't know where your wildlife is, you can't do much about it, where it is and how much we have. And the tigers have taken the precedence of actually doing the largest effort any country has ever done in enumerating the wildlife resources. So Sunita Narayan, who headed this um, tiger task force after the extinction crisis of Sariska in 2005, and one of the lacunas which she found was that India lacked any credible way of actually enumerating what we had in our wildlife. It was like Bilbil's crows, you know. So when Akbar asked Bilbil how many crows are there in Delhi, he said, sir, it's very easy. He said, no, how, tell me how many there are. He says, about 9,999. He says, how can you be so sure? He says, you count them. He says, you know I can't count the crows. He says, you count them and if you find there are more crows, then we are having visitors from the nearby villages, you know. They're coming to Delhi to meet their relatives. What if you have less crows? Well, our crows are going and visiting their relatives. So counting tigers was something akin to Birbal's crows. There was no method to do that. So um, my friend who's sitting there in the audience, Kamar Qureshi, and myself, we developed a method for doing this across a large landscape. And every four years, the government actually has mandated the Wildlife Institute to enumerate the number of tigers. But we use the tigers as an excuse to do a lot of work in counting the rest of our wildlife as well. So what we have found over the past 12 years is that tigers, uh, we were believed to have about 3,500 tigers in India in uh, 2006, but we found that there were only about 1,400 tigers present in the country. And this was a big shock to everybody, and it became a huge political issue. And subsequently, actually, the tiger population has started to increase, and it is increasing at the rate of about 6% uh, per year. And that's, that's really good news, because whatever the government is doing, it's working quite well, and our tiger populations are increasing in India. So this is the scale of the survey that we do every four years. And if you look at the effort which is put in, it's about 44,000 people working for 10 days to collect this information. And then we have a team of about 70 to 80 wildlife biologists who work for about a year and a half to do camera trapping. So this map is a spatial map where each blue dot represents a survey point. It's a patch of forest, about 20 square kilometers, where somebody has actually gone and looked for signs of tigers and documented it. So the red dots tell you where the tigers are. So just by plotting this effort, you can actually get a distribution map of the species. And you can do this not only for tigers, but for all the species, elephants, gaur, dhol, wolves, hyenas. So this information is available across the country for all mammalian species which are detected through sign. Um, the way actually, if you look at this map, this is the Tarai Arc landscape. This is the Himalayas, Nepal here, and the entire belt of the Tarai. So this red dot, blue dots are the surveys done by forest staff in finding out if there are animals present, which species. And these red dots here tell us where they have actually found tiger sign. So we send in a team of biologists who actually goes and surveys this green polygon with camera traps. Okay? So the camera traps are put in, these yellow dots are each one is an individual camera which is put there to photograph animals. And you do an effort across the landscape and you get photographed tigers. So in this area, we photographed about 387 tigers, unique tigers. And when you do actually modeling with it, looking at how many tigers were actually missed, you get an estimate of about 485 tigers in this landscape. So this is how we do the countrywide assessment of not only tigers, leopards, and other wildlife as well. And it's a very nice, um, scientific, robust way where if you did it or we did it, you should get the same answer. So it's a replicable scientific way of doing uh, work and enumerating uh, populations every four years. So this is how tiger scenario looks in the country today. Major populations are marked on this map with their densities and how many individuals are there. Subsidiary to tigers, we have information on most other large mammals, elephants, wild dog, sambar, cheetal, gaur, etc. 
maps of this kind are available for all these species. We also have information on ancillary information on many things like vegetation, habitat. And this is the first map of plant invasives across India which came out of these surveys. So we have all these invasives. These are none, none of them are native Indian plants, but they're invaders who've been established in India and are causing issues. <clears throat> what we find is that an interesting phenomenon that as this is all different kinds of human activities in protected areas or outside protected areas, mind you, this, this information is not only from protected areas, it's across the entire swath of forests of India. So protected areas, revenue forests, protected forests, private forests everywhere. And if you look at this relationship, you see human disturbance on this and large carnivore densities. Here it's tiger density. And as human disturbance increases, tiger density declines. So large carnivores or most wildlife and people don't mix. Of course, there are contradictions to this and I'll talk about that in a little while. Some animals do actually thrive in human habitats, but most wilderness species don't. And tigers are a good wilderness representative. An example of this in Rajaji, which is neighboring to our institute, we had the entire park full of humans, Gujars, who used to graze the buffaloes. And the government took a nice decision of relocating these Gujars with a nice package. And we had one range of Rajaji where the Gujars were relocated. And as soon as the Gujars were relocated, the habitat transformed itself in just two years. Okay? And you had tigers coming in, colonizing the area and starting to breed. Here you see the lactating female, she has cubs. So this happened in just one year. So remove impacts of human beings from natural areas and nature is extremely resilient, it's going to bounce back. The strategy never fails. People out, wildlife in. Very difficult, but it's, that's, that's the basic recipe for any conservation action. There are certain traits of certain species which makes them extinction prone. So you have these species and a comparative list over there. The K strategies and the R strategies. These animals are extinction prone just because of their inherent life history traits. You will not have problems with manas and cockroaches and rodents. We will not have a program cockroach like Project Tiger. You won't need it just because they are not likely to become extinct. Their life history traits are such that they will not become extinct. So this has to be kept in mind when you design conservation strategies. So if you look at just the large cats across the world, you have tigers, leopards, and kruger. On this axis, you have the survivorship of breeders, adults. And on this side, you have the number of animals which are required to be viable over the next 100 years. Okay? So if you have a survivorship of 90%, you'll require close to about 20 tigers in a population for them to persist for the next 100 years. But for the same population, a 75% survival rate is sufficient for leopards, or for Kruger for that matter. Leopard is a little higher. You need about 85% survivorship. So what it tells us, this graph tells us, uh, in other words, just the same data set in other words, if you look at this, this is the survivorship contours, okay? This is the interbirth interval, the time taken from one birth to another birth of litters, and the age of first reproduction. When does a female become mature enough to have a first litter. If you plot this, you see that tigers are far away compared to the other cats. That shows that tigers are more case selected, they just cannot take human induced mortality. If you have poaching happening on these animals, they are likely to become extinct. Similarly, you could hunt some leopards and their populations would bounce back again. So these animals can take some level of removal by human factors, but the animals which are up there just cannot. So this is the inherent biology of some species which one needs to take cognizance of when designing conservation strategies. However, even if all our efforts in conserving tigers and the population showing a positive trend, the major cause of tiger deaths in the last five years are human causes. So poaching is still taking a huge toll on our large cats. And that is, that is what's actually causing extinction of tigers in the remaining part of the world. India doing much better than the others. This kind of activity is just impossible for any case-selected species to actually um, cope up with. So what we have here is the demographic characteristics of tigers. 
done from telemetry research uh, done by me and my colleagues here. And what we did was we modeled what size of a population is actually required in a tiger reserve so that extinction will not happen just by natural processes. And we found, just similar to that paper which I showed you earlier, that if you had 20 tigresses in a core area of a tiger reserve, then that population is likely to survive for the next 100 years with a very low probability of extinction. Okay. And if you can see this, this is the number of tigers uh, poached per year and the probability of extinction. So the extinction probability of even one or two tigers being poached is about less than 5% in the next 100 years if you had 20 breeding units in one tiger reserve. Now, if you look at our tiger reserves in India, maybe four or five tiger reserves are large enough to have a population of 20 breeding units. So tiger reserves are still not big enough for long-term survival. And in spite of that, if you have poaching in those tiger reserves, these populations are doomed to die. Unless, of course, there's something we do about it. Also, large cats like tigers, lions, and leopards eat a lot of these critters around them. They require a lot of food. A tiger, on the average, will take about 150 cheetal-sized animals on the year. So to sustain a tiger in a population of taking 150 cheetal, you need 1,500 population of cheetal. So, because it's going to harvest 150, and at a 10% production rate, about 1,500 cheetal are required per individual tiger in a reserve for it to be sustained. So you need large areas, very large areas, to actually conserve these species. So if you look at this graph here, um, you have ungulate abundance, okay? That is the number of deer per kilometer, and you have tiger density. As the density of ungulates increases, the density of large carnivores increases. So if there's food, there are more abundant large carnivores. What does that mean? Food means the vegetation is good. Vegetation means the soil is good. So the large carnivores actually act as a very nice surrogate for biodiversity conservation. The whole ecosystem functions, goods, services, everything below them is doing really well if you have large carnivores in an ecosystem. However, most of the forests outside of protected areas, if you see, if you go around, there'll be green forests. Go to the northeast, wonderful green forests. But do you, do, do you see any ungulates? None. They're all eaten up. Okay. So in, only in national parks and sanctuaries do you get some ungulates. And that's where these cats are. So we have a huge problem, and this is related to poverty and subsistence level poaching. People use our wildlife as nutrition or as proteins. And we sh sort of tend to shove it under the carpet. We just don't acknowledge the fact that people are actually hunting ungulates and that's why you don't have wildlife in those areas. And we need to address this. It's much more of a chronic problem than poaching of tigers. Okay? Because if without this, no tigers, no leopards, no lions can exist in any area. So the next concept which I would like to talk about is the core areas. With telemetry studies, we found that breeding large carnivores are only found in the core of tiger reserves. This is the buffer zone. And this is the core, the light blue is the core area. But sub-adult animals and surplus animals who are ousted as breeders actually can use a lot of this area, which is the buffer zone. So the breeding happens in the heart of a reserve where human disturbance is minimal. And the buffer zone is a multiple use area. You have people also living there, wildlife conservation as well going on there. These are used by, oops, sorry. These are used by the uh, sub-adult animals and surplus animals. So on this basis, we advised the government to design tiger reserves. And they actually did that. They amended the Wildlife Protection Act. And they said that tiger reserves should have a core which houses 20 breeding units of tigers at least. And that is anywhere from 800 to 1,000 square kilometers in size. And you need that as a core area of tiger reserves. If you have that core area, you can have anywhere between 75 to 100 tigers in a tiger reserve. And this population is viable for the long term. Okay? So this is the dynamics of tiger populations within the core and the buffer. And the core area is to be made inviolate. Inviolate means no human settlement should be present in the core. How do you do that? You can't evict anybody now. You can't force people out of their homes. So you have to give them an offer 
which they can't refuse. So the people are happy, and you get an area which is inviolate for wildlife. So the maximum, what the government is doing today, and I think the best conservation initiative which the government of India has, is relocation of human settlements from critical tiger habitats in the country. Okay? The budget is really good. During Jairam Ramesh's time, it reached a peak of about uh, 20 million US dollars, which was given uh, for village relocation. And right now, I think we have close to about uh, 200 crores being allotted this year for village relocation. And it's incentivized voluntary relocation. If people don't want to go out, they won't go out. They can stay there. But you give them an offer, which is so good that they would love to go out. And that's what keeps them. So you have these small hamlets inside the protected area, in the heart of the tiger reserve, in the core area. Give them a nice housing opportunity, hospitals, schools, electricity, roads, opportunity to do business, and they'll move out with this incentive. And what we have now created is about a core of about 34,000 square kilometers, the size of a Serengeti in India, without people. This is the best conservation strategy one can do for wildlife. Because if you have habitat, there is future. If you don't have habitat, there is no future. Land is the utmost difficult thing to get in a highly populated country like ours. Yet, as I told you, many of these tiger reserves do not have the size of the population required for long-term persistence. What do you do then? So this, for example, has a population of about 800 square kilometer size. You have 20 breeding tigresses, no problem. But this region here is too small. The core is very small, about 10 breeding units. The chances of extinction are very high, unless they're connected with a corridor. So this corridor becomes an essential link for a metapopulation existence of not only tigers, but all wildlife, for that matter. And the corridors are crucial. However, if you look at real life situations, this is Kanha Tiger Reserve, this is Achanakmar, Pench, and these are the forest corridors in between them. These are protected areas, but the corridors are not. They are traversing through community lands, private lands, government owned lands, and so forth. So if you look at this slide here, you can see this is Achanakmar, Kanha, Pench, Satpura. Wonderful forest linkages. Corridors are there. What's the problem? The problem is this, linear infrastructure. Okay? These corridors are highly fragmented. We have made sure that if an animal wants to move from one reserve to another, it goes through 100 deaths before it can actually make it there. Okay? So very few, if 100 animals try to move out, maybe one will do it. Okay? So it is really, really a tenuous journey for them to actually share the genetic material between two reserves. So what we have is we have used our information from these surveys and designed corridors based on modern theory of conservation biology using computer models and so forth called circuit theory. And these yellow lines here tell you the flow in which tigers can actually move through the landscape. So wherever the dark lines are there, those are pinch points where the animals get concentrated. When there's a swath of yellowness, animals have an easier passage through those areas. So these are circuit scape pathways done for all tiger reserves in the country. So these are available with the government today as shape files. And any development project which comes up needs to go through these uh, before it gets sanctioned. So this, if you look at this corridor, which is between Corbett and Dudwa, you can see this red line here. That's the corridor. And this is between Kana Tiger Reserve and Taroba in Maharashtra. This red line here, and the lights, you can't see that very clearly. These bright lights are pictures by a satellite at night. So those are urban areas. 10 years later, this is what has happened. Okay? So most of the, this is all Chhattisgarh. Chhattisgarh has developed like crazy. Okay? Corbett, Haldwani Township has come up and severed this corridor. So you need to have mitigation measures at these pinch points in these corridors if animals are actually to go from one area to another. Okay. So we've tried to find out whether these corridors actually exist or are they just an artificial artifact of computer modeling. And what we did was we did genetic studies to find out if animals are actually moving between these reserves and not. And we did find gene flow between these central Indian landscape, even in spite of all the fragmentation I showed you. So even if the roads are present, and all that is present, animals are still using these corridors to move from one area to another. So that is some ray of hope that it's not too late 
but how long? These highways are now being four-laned, eight-laned, and the moving of the vehicles are getting so fast that unless something is done, these corridors, which are existing and being used, will go very rapidly. So you need to have landscape-level plans, which integrates not only the developmental needs, but also conservation needs and community needs on an equal footing, which is not existent in any of our plans today. Uh, an important aspect which we do at the Wildlife Institute is actually do environmental impact assessment. For example, a coal block which is coming up here, well, they just wanted to renew their lease and it had come for a renewal. It's not within a protected area. This is Satpura Tiger Reserve, this is Pench Tiger Reserve, and this forest is reserve and revenue forest. But now since the corridors are mapped and available with the government agencies, anything which is in the vicinity of tiger reserves needs to go through an impact assessment. And what we found is that this lease can be given for this part of the uh, coal mines, but these mines over here, would have, if you give them, if you allow them, they're going to severe the corridor between Satpura and Pench. And that will be the end of uh, both these tiger populations, actually. So this is the kind of recommendations which go out of uh, the institute that we're dealing with. Okay. However, development is going to happen. We can't stop it. But we need to find ways and means to mitigate its impact on um, our wildlife uh, uh, conservation values. And there are ways to do that. So if you can see you know, the, the overpasses, the underpasses, you can see actually elephants using these underpasses. In fact, um, we have elephants using a much more difficult underpassage uh, near Dehradun um, in the Ganga channel there. And they actually learn very easily to use these passages. So these need to be developed when develop, uh, linear infrastructure projects come up. You have pathways even for crabs or canopy connecting pathways for squirrels and gibbons and um, the arboreal fauna which is present in these areas. How do you make this happen? Uh, Bittu isn't here, but he had some wonderful ideas that most of these corridors pass through real difficult agricultural areas where people don't make much out of it, but they have to plow because they have to eat a living out of it. If we could promote agroforestry in these areas. Now, agroforestry is fraught with its own problems because you have, there's a lot of capital which gets locked up for a very long time. And people need to eat on a daily basis. So this is not going to thrive unless it is subsidized, either by industry or whatever else, by private ownership or something like that. So then you could have forests in these corridor areas and harvested in a cyclical manner so the wildlife values as well as the communities could benefit out of it. And this is a sort of a continued activity. It's not a one-time goal. It is it's something like what you'd call a maintenance activity for biodiversity conservation. And the world's community as well as society needs to pay for it. A question which we are often asked is that we've got about 2,200 tigers in the country. Can we have more tigers? And I think I need to answer that question. Many of the tiger populations in our country are currently somewhere over here, okay, the current population, while the carrying capacity is much higher. So we have these reserves already in place, protected areas already in place, which are way below their carrying capacity. About 8,000 square kilometers of good protected area is available, but with tiger densities either absent or at very low level. So we can add another 400 to 500 tigers just by managing these areas pretty well without adding any more uh, protected areas. Um, this is Kamar here, um, sitting right there. Relocation, introduction. There's one active strategy which one needs to involve in for maintaining biodiversity today. We cannot wait for animals to move through corridors. Sometimes active management is an absolute must. Some places just cannot be connected with corridors. They're lost. For example, Sariska, the closest source population for tigers is Ranthambore. No connectivity in between. You have to airlift animals and take them there. Then people would argue, why do you need corridors if you could do that? You don't need corridors. But mind you, we're using tigers as an umbrella species. You could move tigers, but what about gore? What about dhol? What about seed dispersal? What about butterflies moving from one place to the other? If you have corridors, then the entire biota can use these corridors for movement and gene exchange. So corridors are an absolute must. If you don't have them, some species we can do artificially. 
but you cannot do the entire spectrum of biodiversity. So corridors cannot be compromised and we should try to advocate them as much as possible. So there are certain mechanisms which the government has adopted and uh, it's trying to do its best of course against all odds and those are some examples here. Kuno Wildlife Sanctuary is a typical example in Madhya Pradesh uh, where a lot of investment men went in to remove people from inside the park so that the sanctuary would be an ideal situation to take lions from Gujarat and put them in Kuno. So it has served as a wonderful showcase of what can be done when people are removed from a protected area. We had density, we've been monitoring Kuno for the last 15 years or so, a density of about 5 cheetal per square kilometer when we started with the relocation program. Today, they are close to about 60 cheetal per square kilometer. Exponential growth of ungulates has happened there. Leopard population density has quadrupled in that area. It's ready for a large carnivore. Okay? Lions, if they are taken there, they would thrive. Of course, everything doesn't work on science. Uh, it's, it's, conservation is about politics. It's, science is only about 10% of it. So we have actually mastered the art of relocating large ungulates. Gore translocation. Bandogar had lost its entire population of gore. It was rehabilitated about five years ago, and now there's a thriving gore population in uh, Bandogar taken from uh, Kana. In situ conservation, like for Barasinga, for example, in Kana, the Barasinga population had dropped down to about 60 individuals due to heavy tiger predation. Okay, and so what they did was they made an enclosure, brought in the Barasinga into this predator proof enclosure, allowed them to increase in numbers, and then release them. Today we have close to about 600 Barasinga in Kana, the only population of hard ground Barasinga. So these are in situ management issues, tools which people now know to use them and they're being used quite actively across the country. So there is, there is hope in wildlife conservation. I'll talk a little bit about lions. Uh, there's another species which I've been studying for about 20 years now. And I'll just to recap, the Asiatic lion subspecies ranged across Persia, Northern Africa, and into India, all the way up to Palamo and Bihar. Now, uh, the range in India was something like this. And today, the range is limited to the Gir forests in Gujarat. Okay. There were close to about 50 lions left um, in about 100 square kilometers at the turn of the sanctuary. And the Nawab of Junagadh actually didn't allow hunting. He stopped hunting. And now, with the Gujarat government doing the right things at the right time, the lion population from Gir has expanded into the lower half of Saurashtra, covering about 10,000 square kilometers about 500 lions. It's a great success story for a densely populated country like ours. Having a large carnivore increase from 50 to 500, I think it's something to be applauded. And the government needs to be you know, really given a big hand with cap on its back. Unfortunately, they're not giving the lions to Kuno, but that's, a, that's something which we need to fight over. So this population of lions which lives outside here is living in a human-dominated agro-pastoral landscape. There are no protected areas here. Gir is about 1,800 square kilometers. This is about 10,000 square kilometers. Okay. How do these lions actually live with people? It's just a contradiction of what I was saying, that large carnivores and people don't mix. Lions are proving to be a contradiction. Now, the issue with lions, I've radio collared many of these lions. As you can see, there's a collar here. And you can see these are different home ranges of lions. This lion alone had a home range of 2,000 square kilometers. Okay living outside the park. Inside the park, the same lion would have a home range of 200 square kilometers. 10 times larger home ranges outside than inside because the resources are much poorer outside. They need much larger space to get the same resource as they would get inside. Gear is only 1,800 square kilometers. So if you wanted to have a viable population of lions, which is about 500 lions, inside a protected area, we don't have the space. Okay? So lions have no choice but to live in human-dominated landscapes, though it's not the best habitat for them, as can be seen from the size of their home ranges. They would prefer to live inside the protected area, but they don't have a choice. If you look at this, is a radio location of a satellite collar of a lion, right over here. Okay? It's, this is a village. So at night, lions can go anywhere. Okay? They can be just outside your house, no conflict. Okay? At the daytime, what would happen is this lion is spending all his time here in about a one hectare patch of shrubbery. He's sleeping there, 
people are doing their work all around, fields are being ploughed, cattle are coming, cattle are going. They don't even know the lion is there. So the lions have learned to live a very cryptic life with people, with minimal conflict. Of course, there's an occasional conflict, but we'll talk about that in a while. So you have this information here, and these lions are doing really well. Yet, when the lions in this landscape, when they want to reproduce, they go to a patch as far away as possible from people as much as possible. So these are night lights. This is Savarkundla city, Amreli city. This is uh, Palitana here. So this is Gir, okay? So this is, this is Una. If you know Gujarat, then you'll understand what we are talking about. And these are these refuges in which the lions are actually living. Basically, at night they go everywhere, but during the daytime they have to come back to this refuge. And it is only in these refuges, away from people, that they actually can breed. Okay? So even though they live with humans, they cannot actually reproduce with humans. Um, I'll just skip this, no lack of time. The lions, if you look at them, how can they live with people without conflict? They are carnivores, they have to eat meat. Okay? What is happening here is, if you look at this information here, this is wild ungulate prey, this is livestock which are scavenged, and this is livestock which are killed. This red part of the diet of the lion is very small. They're not killing livestock, they are scavenging livestock. Gujarat has surplus cattle, okay? Lot of feral cattle, which die. And you have a lot of giants, Neeta madam, excuse me. A lot of giants who actually do a lot of donation to keep these cattle alive in Panjara ports, okay? And a lot of deaths of these cattle happening. These lions thrive on this. So you can see this lion here actually feeding on livestock. This, this is a rare event where a lion is actually killing a good gear cow. Okay? So you have, the other thing is, the people in gear are extremely tolerant to lions. Why? The issue is that these people which live inside the forest, they have free resources to the forest. They graze their cattle, they use the topsoil as dung and manure and they sell it. They make about 76% more profit than their counterparts living outside the forest. Okay? And the government actually compensates them for all the cattle which is killed by the lions. So it's a win-win situation for the people living inside the forest. With a little bit of wielding of the stick and the laws in place, people live with lions because they benefit by living inside the forest due to free resources. Okay? So it's a win-win situation for lions as well as the people to some extent. Outside the protected area, you have a landscape like this. Okay? A lot of cattle and good habitat. And the people are extremely tolerant. As long as the lions are not killing them or the kids or the cattle, they don't mind them. In fact, this is what the situation is. Lot of cattle. Okay? So the lions are having a field day in this landscape with people. Now if you look at this slide here, you will see that you have a spectrum of wilderness species to human tolerant or common cell species, which live with people. Okay. So you have the tiger, the wolf, the lion, the hyena, jackal, fox, and, and the spectrum. Now what about these animals? Okay. They are contradictions, they live with people. So um, in my career I've had the opportunity of working with these animals as well. And what we found is, if looking at wolves, these are the home ranges of wolves. Okay. In the Bhal region of Gujarat, where Bhagwat sir has visited me while I was doing my PhD there. He was one of my co-supervisors. And what you see here, are the edges of these home ranges, there are villages. But none of the villages is in the core area. So the core area of a wolf pack or the wolf territory where it does the breeding and has its pups is very far away from villages as possible, but it uses the village resources, the scavenging opportunities of dead livestock and the opportunity to kill sheep and goats. So they want to have villages as resources within their territories, but not have their home near human beings. Okay. The same is seen in the Kutch area, and this is the Bhal area. Okay. So, and the traditional livelihoods of people is what supports these carnivores. So this livelihood, traditional livelihood changes, these carnivores are going to go out of these landscapes. This is, okay, now this I'll explain a little bit. The lighter blue colors, if you see these polygons, I don't know if you can see them from there. Each polygon represents a village. So this is a GIS surface of a gradient of the dark blue means no people, okay? The light blue means a lot of people. 
and the red dots are dens of hyena, hyena dens. So even though hyenas can live in a human dominated landscape, their dens are as far possible uh, from villages as much as they can do that. So they are avoiding people even if they are living in human dominated landscapes. The same with foxes. Okay? If you look at this, this is the Indian fox and these are villages and this is the dark blue areas are the best. How far they can get because if you go in one direction, the other village starts. It's a human dominated landscape. So this is the furthest they can go and that's where the dens are. So all these animals, though they live with humans, they tend to avoid them to the best of their ability. They have no choice, that's why they live with people. The most common cell species that we see, the black kite. Okay, we've got a nice student working with us in Delhi. Uh, we put tags on them and these are nest densities. So if you look at this, this is the urban, uh, this is a gradient of urbanization. Okay? So this is the least urban to the maximum urban. And you see the nest densities, there are most nests in the medium disturbance area where there is greenery and humans. So there are resources of garbage disposal, a lot of food availability and there are natural areas. So the kites have the maximum nesting sites but not in the highly urban areas at all. This is of course the density in Delhi. So this is the highly urban areas and you see even the most common cell species of wildlife tries to avoid humans. Okay, conflict, the last bit of it. Um, we have a huge problem with wildlife conflict and mostly it's attributed to wildlife populations increasing um, without any control. And this happens when you have, sorry, when you have locally abundant species uh, like the black buck or the Neil guy, but that's because we have changed their environment, S food surplus is created and these populations of these animals cannot be regulated by themselves. There are no carnivores left and they have not evolved under a system where they have self-regulatory mechanisms. So they erupt and they cause destruction. The issue is that if you, can, if you look at this, this is the perceived negative interaction, this is the actual negative interaction and this is the social tolerance. This is what it is and this is what we want it to become. Okay? So we want to increase the social tolerance of people and bring the perceived damage and the actual damage together so that people actually have an informed decision as to whether there is damage or it's in your mind. The media plays a huge role in this. Any event of human attack on a human being or livestock is grossly exaggerated and you have Adam Khor leopards coming on TV almost on a daily basis. So that is the media's role, it's not the reality. Now I couldn't refrain without talking about the bustard which uh, um, Deepak mentioned. Um, the bustard is on its way out unless we do something very, very fast about it. Uh, we are late. Dr. Rehmani has spent an entire lifetime trying to do something about this bird. He's managed to a great extent, but it's not enough. Luckily, the government has woken up and invested a substantial sum of money. Yet there are politics of conservation, like Rajasthan refusing to give the eggs to Gujarat because they are not giving the lions to Madhya Pradesh and so on and so forth. But those will always remain in our country and we have to work around them. The major problems, there are less than 150 birds left in the entire global population of this bird, 150 birds. And the birds which are there are not safe. Uh, the major problems with bustard is direct hunting, uh, egg collection, power line and windmills, nest predation, intensive agriculture, infrastructural development, ill-informed management, grasslands being converted to forests or prosopis plantations, uh, livestock overgrazing, spread of and then you have wasteland development strategies and the worst thing is the policy of conservation. We have created protected areas in the name of bustard so large that people have become hostile towards the bird themselves. Okay? And these birds are landscape dependent birds. You cannot have them in isolated small PAs and say that okay 200 square kilometers is enough because a bird covers in a year over 1000, 2000 square kilometers. So 200 square kilometers is just not enough for them. Um, so there's in situ management, uh, which is happening now, uh, predator proof fencing. So where the breeding areas are there, sir, uh, Remani sir, actually they've done this in the Thar now, dug the fence down, removed all the predators. And this year we had a good uh, chick success. Uh, we went to the Thar together a few months ago. Uh, we have started um, mapping all the power lines there and uh, we're going to put markers on all of them. So this will, see the issue is this, this bird doesn't have frontal vision. It can see from the side and it's such a big bird that it cannot maneuver itself. 
So when it comes in line with a, you know, a sort of a misnet of power lines, it has just sure death and it's just waiting to happen. So unless there are these power lines go underground or they are marked, of course underground is the best option but it's going to cost crores to do that. I don't think it's ever going to happen. But marking is possible and the, the uh, Rajasthan Electricity Board has actually agreed to do this. So we're going to give them a cost and they're going to start doing this. And we have already started a dog campaign to remove all the dogs from this region. Uh, the issue is that with the coming of the Indira Gandhi Canal in the Thar, species which the bustard was never used to, pigs, dogs, mongooses, Indian fox, which were not there, have all come into its habitat and all are predating on its chicks and eggs. So this is something which the bird is not evolved to deal with and they need to be removed in case if you want that. Um, coming to the rescue of the bird is a very important scientific endeavor with conservation breeding. Like you're doing for the vultures, this needs to be done for the bustard as well and there are several examples where conservation breeding has been extremely successful at, as an insurance against total extinction. And in case there are habitats and areas available in the future, they can be rehabilitated. So this is what we are planning for the bustard, a breeding center in Rajasthan because we could not do one in Gujarat and hopefully it should happen in the next year to come. Another species on its way out is the Shanghai. Okay. And again, it's the same problem, all the eggs in one basket. It's a habitat specialist, it's called the dancing deer because it lives on floating vegetation and there are less than 150 animals left in the wild. So they're looking for a second home for this, just like the lions and a conservation breeding program. The Gangetic Dolphin. My colleague Kamar Qureshi works on this species and he's got a large grant from Kampa funds to actually do surgical interventions to prevent the extinction of this, <coughs> this aquatic animal, which is the national aquatic animal of the country. It has all the um, usual threats of uh, poaching, um, drowning in nets, pollution and uh, all, all this. But it has survived so far, even with navigation. But the death knell of this species is going to be the new bill which is passed for changing all our rivers into navigational channels. This animal depends on echolocation. And when a boat goes with a sonar, it, it just cannot find its food in that environment. And they'll be dredging the rivers to make big ships ply. So I think it's going to go the way the, the Yangtze River dolphin has gone. Uh, even though there are more animals left here, there are close to about 2,000 individuals left. The bustard is only 200. But even then, uh, this is much more difficult to conserve than the bustard is because of what is happening, the threats involved in conserving the species. The dugong. So I'm telling you the worst case scenarios. I told you the good part of conservation and now something which is really bad stories, the dugong. Okay? We have less than 250 individuals left in three populations in Kutch, Gulf of Manar and the Andaman Nicobar Islands. Okay? None of them have gene flow between them and there are no source populations. The closest source population is in the Arabian Peninsular Sea, the Red Sea. I don't think animals are coming here at all. So the chances of these populations just dwindling and dying off is very high. You cannot have a conservation breeding program for the dugong. It's going to be very tough to do that. So this species is also on its way out and I do not see an answer to this. Maybe the marine biologist here can give us some idea of how to go about it. Because the way the traffic is increasing, they are such slow moving animals that the propeller of a ship cuts them up, they get entangled in uh, nets and they drown. So the hope for this species is dismal, yet we are trying to do something, I don't know how we'll succeed. Okay, so the last slide, not the last but almost the last. Um, the most important thing is, if you have habitat and prey and carnivore populations are depressed, just protecting this environment and this habitat will bring it back. If you have no carnivores, you can put back carnivores through reintroductions, like what we did in Sariska and Panna. Okay, so if you go up this pyramid, there's increasing cost. Habitat restoration in our country is almost impossible. So most importantly, if you have secured habitats, everything else can come into place. Secure as much land as you can for biodiversity conservation. If we can do that, we would have lived, left a legacy for our great, great, great grandchildren, which you were talking about. So in conclusion, 
create large inviolate spaces for wildlife as solutions, okay? Maintain habitat connectivity between protected areas. Avoid mixing people and wildlife. Zonation like Kruger. Fence them off 20,000 square kilometers with a fencing. Animals one side, people one side, no problem. Agricultural areas, no damage, nothing, okay? Minimize poaching, especially in small populations, okay? Control problem animals immediately. So if you have a man-eating lion or a tiger, remove it. Otherwise, there'll be a backlash from the population. So this is the ideal world. But the ideal world doesn't exist, okay? So however, our protected areas are too small for viable populations. So inviolate spaces are. Therefore, coexistence with humans is an essential strategy for conservation in our country. We cannot zone them. We cannot put a boundary saying that this is the fence, wildlife this side, people this side. Wildlife will vanish. That's not a conservation strategy at all. So you have no choice but to have coexistence. Buffer zones and corridors are a must. So when you have mixing of people and wildlife, conflict is inevitable. It's bound to happen. It's only managing conflict is the essence. And each conflict is very unique. You cannot have a silver bullet for all conflicts. The manager of each park has to deal with this individually. Understanding the social, economic, and ecological context of conflict is needed for appropriate mitigation. The best long-term conservation strategy is to strive to maintain and establish a metapopulation structure between sources across the landscapes with mitigation measures of infrastructure. Okay? And I'll acknowledge uh, uh, these funders and Mr. J.C. Daniel and Dr. Bhagwat. Uh, Mr. Daniel was responsible for my first association with BNHS, through which I got my PhD. And many of you may not know, but I got my PhD from a project through the BNHS. So uh, I really appreciate the society's uh, help in my career. And lastly, I leave you with this uh, quote, the fate of conservation is not in the hands of scientists or managers, but on how society views and values it, what it is willing to pay, and how it motivates the political will. Thank you. So much. If any questions, I'll it's been a little long, but if you have any questions, that's fine. <laughs> is there any pangolin in Gujarat? Yes, sir. Gir has pangolin. Uh, Kidi khao or ghor khao? Kidi khao. Ghor khao is um, uh, this one. Uh, rattle. Rattle. The honey badger. Ghor khodiu, it's called. Which one? Dugong. Dugong. I don't know what it's called. It's in Kutch. I didn't know that. By Manas, it's mermaid. Mermaid. Literal translation. Yes. Thank you so much, sure. sir, for the enlightening talk. Uh, we request Dr. Deepak Kapte to give away the token of appreciation to Dr. Jhala. Oh, wow. What have we got? Just hold it, right? Hold it, right? Thank you, Deepa. It's a pleasure. We request Ms. Neha Sinha to uh, do the vote.